Welcome to episode 85 of the Bandhive Podcast. You're listening to the Bandhive Podcast, the number one online resource for DIY bands to learn about the music business and touring. If you want to turn your band into a lean, mean touring machine, you're in the right place. Now, let's get this show on the road. It is time for another episode of the Bandhive Podcast. My name is James Cross, and I'm not here with Matt Hose of Alive in Barcelona. They're still up in Washington recording their next album, so keep your eyes and ears out for that soon. In the meantime, I am super stoked to have Adam Loki from Pickwick Commons back on the podcast. Adam and his band were in a video interview we did a few years ago, and also a bonus episode that we put out right at the start of the pandemic about how artists like Pickwick Commons were being affected by everything going on in the world. And we're going to get into that stuff and see how shows have changed in the last year because Adam is also a booking agent with Sleeper Booking and Dynamic Talent International. But before we get into all that stuff and talk about the main topic, Adam, do you want to just share a little bit about your background of why you became a musician and the story of Pickwick Commons? Because this is something that in the past videos and episode, we didn't really touch on because those were like bonus content. So this is your episode, man. Let's hear about who you are and what you do. Yeah, sure. Uh, Musician because, I mean, you know, everyone at some point in middle school is just like, dang, that instrument's kind of cool. I listen to a lot of emotional music. Maybe I should do that. So I did that. And then through high school, I never had like a band that ever got anything together together. So when I went to college, I really wanted to focus on finding that group, right, of people that I could perform with and like, just see what that was really, really like. So I ran into a handful of guys, lineup iterations. At this point, it's been so many years. It's like, you know, you've been through so many lineups, right? Started doing one style, kind of merged as we found new members into uh, something a little different. And then just, you know, I was just enjoying doing something that wasn't just school and wasn't just work that I was passionate about. Like, obviously, there's something really different about like working on a band and working on something you're passionate about than hanging out with your friends. And at the same time, very different from going to work at a nine to five or uh, any job I could find at the time. So that's where I was getting a lot of my fulfillment at the time. And so it just started spitballing and rolling and uh started putting together tours for the band. And that's when I was doing sleeper booking. And now that's kind of a promotional local thing with a couple other guys. Basically use that resume of everything I've done with the band to get a job with Dynamic Talent International, which was Artery Global. And then within within a year of starting there, everything shut down. So the worst timing possible, basically. Yeah, yeah, no. And it's one of those things like my life has always been band, job, something else. So it was band job school. Now it's band job job. At one point in college, I had six part-time jobs to go with band in school and just having a good time at college. So the year off was actually really nice. I played a lot of video games I didn't have time to play prior. I I just kind of got to relax and focus and, and really decide what I wanted to do when it ended, right? Like you don't get that once you're an adult, right? You don't get that break button. And so for me working a normal nine to five was like a break. Because you weren't doing all the extracurriculars. Yeah, it's like occasionally the band would meet. Occasionally I'd check in with the booking people, but it was just like, you know, sitting around a lot of the time. Yeah. Well, before we uh, go on, I know other video game fans are probably going to want to know what was your top game that you went back and played during that time? Uh, So... I went and got a 4K TV in the hopes that a PS5 would be readily available. And I hooked up my K Rocket 6s to the TV. And when I couldn't get a PS5, I went and got Horizon Zero Dawn redownloaded to my PS4. And playing that with low end on like a 70 inch TV was phenomenal. A phenomenal experience that just made it better than the first time I played it. Right now I'm running through Mass Effect Legendary. I'm primarily PlayStation based. I, I do have a PC, but it doesn't have the specs to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that little side note there. Cause I know there's going to be listeners who are like, oh my God, what do you play? Cause I'm a gamer too. So I know somebody's going to be asking those questions. So talking a little bit about Pickwick Commons in the video interview series that we did, I think that was two years ago now. Pre-pandemic, before COVID was a thing in anyone's imagination. I want to say it was fall 2019. Yeah, I think it was even earlier than that. I want to say it was like April or May. Fall 2018. Fall 2018 through Canada. Because it was with false accusations. 
and they picked up either that date or the next date. Or was it a tour after that? Ah, Doesn't matter. They all blend together. It was sometime around two years ago. (laughs) But yeah, you guys had just come from Canada. That is definitely accurate. And you were talking about how it was still so cold here, but people were just wearing hoodies and you guys were like all bundled up. (laughs) Yeah, I used to live in Minnesota and I've spent too long in Indiana. I I don't have the resilience anymore. Yeah, no, it it changes so fast. I was in SoCal for two years and I came back. I was like, oh, it's actually insanely cold. Anyway, so when we talked with you guys two years ago, roughly, whatever that was, we talked with you and Brandon, your drummer, who you both co-managed the band. It was basically all about how you guys run the business. And so the question here is, how are the two of you preparing for the return of the band to the road? Because that was one of the big things we talked about was your interesting and very useful technique of going two weeks in every direction. And that way, putting together essentially as big of a tour as you can, but only spending two weeks at a time out on the road. Yeah, it was actually nine to 10 days. So we get two weekends and we target to have one or no off dates. We got to do the entire everywhere but the West. No Colorado, no California. All those insanely long drives. Yeah. So the first thing we did was everyone's going to stop doing things. That's what we said. Everyone's going to stop releasing. They're all going to delay their records because they were hoping to tour on it and they want to wait and see if they can tour on it if things come back six months from now. The very first thing we said is we should get some stuff out. Nothing's coming out right now. Let's get some stuff out. And so we, you know, we had some singles for a while that we were able to put together some clips of like old live footage to make some really like cool little shots promo videos, but not music videos. So it was, do we really need a music video? We just want them to stream it. Money's tight. The world's going crazy. Let's not blow money on a music video. Let's do this. So we started recording singles. And then we were like, our our writing process takes a really long time. So we should throw a list of covers together we would be interested in doing. So we started putting out the singles and we went with a rebrand. It was time to just put a name on what we were doing because we've been calling it progressive, modern, hardcore. Progressive to insinuate we play weird time signatures. Modern to insinuate we're not old school hardcore, obviously. You have the production quality. Yeah, and hardcore because we felt that was a better overall fit than metalcore. The mentality of DIY, of caring about what you're doing, caring about the people around you. We thought that insinuated hardcore. So then that's just kind of a generic term. We threw three generic terms together and said, that's as close as we can get. (laughs) I don't know who said it. I think Colin came up with it or he had heard it somewhere. But we'd been talking about like caveman riffs, which is basically a weird time signature riff. And you're going kick, snare, kick, snare. And it's kind of off putting from the weird stuff going on. So we decided to go with the name Caveman Mathcore. That was our new subgenre. And so we put in some money into some new, a slightly different art style focused on black and white. We did merch line, changed the fonts we used regularly. And, you know, we upped our production quality and songwriting as much as we could, you know, every time you try to record. So that, that was cool. And then after we had put out three singles, it was, okay, we need more time for these other songs. They're not coming along quickly. So we started working on those covers. And we had a list of five covers, and only one of those five ever came out, and that was Cigaro by System of a Down. And it was a really fun thing to do. It was close enough to the genre we thought like people would, could have fun with it. It's a silly-sounding song lyrically, even though it's a serious topic, and um, we've always tried to not take ourselves too seriously. We just want to have a good time, right? You have to find, when you've been in a band for like four years or whatever, that balance between is this adding something to my life? And am I, am I having a good time? Do I enjoy doing this? If you enjoy making music, you're having a good time. And so one of the things we enjoyed is just kind of doing a song that was out there. So that all came together. Then WAP by Cardi B came out. And every time a song that is that big and becomes that much of a meme comes out, there's a time limit. It's how long until someone does a death metal cover? How long until someone does blah, blah, blah. And we had a serious conversation because we'd never wanted to do a punk goes pop cover, but we're like, we have a home studio. We're free this weekend. Like, this isn't really us, but should we do it? Because it would be funny. Just, you know, it'd be ludicrous. Just someone yelling all of that. And, you know, we're all dudes. So yelling about our pussies kind of seemed satirical. (laughs) (laughs) And so it was like, it could be fun. People will have fun with it. We can do it first-ish, and everyone's just stuck at home right now. Like, at least I hope they get a laugh. And so 
we had to convince all of ourselves internally as well. So it was like, okay, we'll start recording. And if it sounds good, we'll keep going. But if if it's not going anywhere, we we just need to stop. Don't try too hard. Don't force it. And unfortunately, it went really well. (laughs) (laughs) And I had to be like, okay, let's do it. And so then we shot like a music video and I was like, well, what can we do for a music video in Indiana in the middle of a pandemic? So we just went out to like Brandon's fiance's parents. They have like some woods in, in some land and just did like redneck stuff. We bought a bunch of liquid death water because we thought it'd be again, funny to just like over sponsor something that wasn't sponsoring us. We did reach out and be like, Hey, you want to like promote this with us? But you know, it was like one of those things like, yeah, we're just going to do it because it's funny. And if they, if they say something, then that's awesome. So it was just one of those things. We just threw a bunch of ideas in a bin and just kept going. We kept rolling. When that was all done and out, obviously there was the internet reaction of this is the worst song ever and this is the best song ever. Polarizing opinions. Yeah, we knew what it would do. We knew exactly what it would do. It would get people to talk and say, I hate this or I love this. Then we were at a point where we had just put a lot of time into that. We only did it over the course of a week, but it was a lot of time. So it was time to say, okay, what's the plan moving forward? Because we still have these other singles that aren't done. We have four other covers we were going to do. And it became, let's just prep to come back. We'll get some singles done. We'll write, but we won't focus on releasing. We put something out, right? Ended up being five songs last year. So the focus now has been best return impact possible and no more bad shows. It used to be a book. You start four months out, you try to follow a route, you know, you try to make your drives not too bad. It's like, oh, let's not do an eight hour drive. Let's just find that four hours away show, make the tour a little longer. And we said, no, we're going to drive eight hours. If we have to drive eight hours, we're going to only play good shows. If there's going to be a day off, it better be Monday or Tuesday because we need to drive 12 hours to get a Saturday show. The problem right now is everyone's announcing tours and you need to be able to flip the switch and, oh, that tour announced uh, the same date as us. Cool. Guess we're swapping to another eight-hour drive and we have to backtrack four hours to get back to that city the next day, then that's fine. That's what we've got to do. Planning around that, because we were a very live-focused band, planning that has been the main focus right now. Everyone also got scattered by the pandemic. So Colin, our guitarist, is driving all over the country, installing like Ethernet cables for Taco Bells and stuff. Brandon's in Nashville doing a studio apprenticeship because it's the middle of COVID. This is like probably the last chance I have to do something like this. Wes is here in town, but he got engaged. So he's been, you know, enjoying that moving forward in his life. And I've been in town and I didn't do much for most of the year, but now I have a ton to do all the time with booking. So it's flip flopped. Yeah, everything's catching up to you now. If I'd started sooner, it wouldn't be any better, though. It would still be the same nightmare. Well, I think one thing that every artist now is going to be struggling with is, like you said, tours announcing for the same night in the same city. And obviously, you can look at the tour dates that bands are announcing, but do you have a way to quickly and easily cross-check? Like, Do you have a system, or is it just you go through every single date the band posts and double-check it against yours? So a lot of the promoters for hardcore bands and and whatever else uh, close to that scene that I work on, they all know what's in town already. That's already been announced. And they'll just tell me when I hit them up. They'll be like, hey, that's in town. That happens a lot of times for most bands. Occasionally you find out the hard way after three weeks and you, you scramble, right? But luckily I'm not booking anything that's coming out for at least my roster in in the next two months. My bands are doing the one-off shows, small weekend runs, nothing substantial till October. And what we're going to see is tours like pop up overnight for August, early fall. Everyone was ready to gamble on November and October, right? But some people seeing how well that's going are going to say, well, let's put together a run, book it in a week. These venues have openings and they they want shows. They want shows and people want to go out again. Wherever that lands with COVID is still remains to be seen. Yeah, it's incredible to see how quick things are changing or how quickly things are changing We're recording this on June 16th, and the episode drops July 13th. So four weeks from now, by the time this episode drops, things could be totally different. Yeah, it could be totally outdated, what I say. The country could be totally open, or we could be in the next lockdown. Like, who knows? I mean, knock on wood, that doesn't happen, but the world's changing so quickly. Seems like we're going to open. And it seems like, what is it, July, our local all-ages venue, 200 cap Hoosier Dome, they're opening. And it's mask if you're not fully vaccinated. I don't know if they have the capability to check for vaccination cards at the door. I don't know if, you know, people will care at that point. I'm ready to go to a show. (laughs) I've been vaccinated, fully vaccinated for over a month. 
So I'm ready to go. If things start turning sour, I will definitely play it more careful. But I really do think things are going to happen this year. I don't think we're going to shut back down, at least not in the same way. Yeah. I mean, here in Vermont, we are fully open now because we crossed 80% statewide vaccinations. We're having baseball games again. Now, granted, those are outside, but our venues have started booking shows again. And I think it's going to be a really great year, especially the further we go into this and we see numbers decline even more. I look forward to the rest of the country joining us in being able to open safely and effectively. Yeah. A handful of states have been doing tours since, you know, April. Limited cap, maybe, but still doing tours. Yeah. And just on the episode that's dropping, I think, two weeks before this one, we had an artist who has played 50 shows and live streams, a mixture of both, in the last year. All the shows were socially distanced and safe. Episode 83, booking and playing 150 shows a year while working a day job. Now. 150s, obviously, during non-pandemic times. And that was with Troy Millette of Troy Millette and the Fire Below. So if anyone wants to check that episode out, just go to bandhive.rocks slash 83. But yeah, it's just incredible how things are opening up and how artists who wanted to were able to play shows. And, you know, Troy's in a much more relaxing genre. He does like folk rock. So he's able to go play a cafe or a restaurant, which for you guys would not be a thing that happens. That would be off brand to say the least. Yeah, it was like uh, I saw like maybe a couple hardcore shows happen at different points during the last year. And the thing is, they'd always say socially distance and you'd show up and they'd be moshing with no masks into each other. It's like, Oof. you're you're saying the right thing. You're not doing what you're saying, though. Actions speak louder than words. And, you know, if it's a 10 person show and they all just hang out together anyways, who cares? You're not really spreading your germ circle. You're still in your pod, yeah. I'm ready to go back out. I would be ready to play a show in July for sure. I have no problem with that in the current climate and what I'm seeing. Well, so you mentioned the challenge of all these other artists clamoring for shows, announcing shows the same night. Are there other challenges you're facing when you're trying to book tours for later in the year? Yeah, managing expectations. So understanding promoters may have quit, venues have shut down. They might not have any money if they still are doing things. You don't know what's going to happen as far as how the shows are going to do. Again, if someone else announces a show in town, which also affects the money, which affects the promoter's willingness to do more, the venue. And then you also don't know how long people are going to be excited for shows. So right now, it seems like everyone's ready to go to a show as well as play a show. How many times do you have to see a bad, you know, not to shoot anyone down, But if you're not rehearsed, have bad tone, and can't sing well live, how many times is someone going to be willing to come out early to see your set or check out the band after? If someone goes to big shows in town and then the first local show they go to is garbage, they're not going to another local show. So managing the expectation that we can just throw a show together and people come out because they're excited might not be true. And we don't know when that'll end. And festival culture is also still a major issue because a lot of people rescheduled festivals for the fall. And that means a lot of people have money invested in the fall, which means they might not have so much money for tickets and merch. It's all over the place. Like what I've been saying is there are no rules anymore. We'll give it all a shot. Yeah. So the only rule is that Don't expect everything will fall in place, which I mean, it shouldn't be a rule in the first place because tours are tours and stuff happens, but especially now. Yeah, it's harder to estimate consistency. You kind of know how a tour is going to do within a week of starting to book it, how quick people are getting back to you. You know how well the tour is going to perform and how many people are going to come up usually, you know, again, within a week of the tour being announced. Now you don't. Yeah, so with all these changes... And it's always booking as a relationship game. Like if you have a relationship with a promoter, it's easier to book a show. Do you think that for the DIY artists who don't already have a relationship, is that going to be even more difficult now? Because the people who have relationships are going to have so many more shows, essentially, with the backlog of the last year and a half. Yeah, but it's always been the same way to make those connections. Go to a show. Go to a show, talk to people, make friends, open a show for an out-of-town band. It's always that same thing. Yeah, and a lot of these regular promoters within different subgenres, it's not across the board, but I've seen plenty of them say, I'm only going to book a handful of shows this year. I'm not ready to commit my money and time again to all that when I didn't do it for a living. Yep. Got to hedge your bets, essentially, is what they're saying. Yeah. I've been focused on small runs and one-offs for bands. And I think if you're going to do something longer than five days, you got to be ready to 
lose. You got to be ready to lose either money because you're driving really far or shows because other shows announce. Yeah, it sounds like a minefield. You're walking through a minefield just waiting for one of the dominoes to drop and knock them all down. Yeah, completely unpredictable. I wouldn't have thought of booking a week-long tour a month ago. Now I'm trying to get a few of my bands to do it, and they're all interested in it. And even though I'm trying to get them to do it, I'm also thinking like, oh, a week from now, I'm going to think this is a bad idea. But I I can't let that, and, and you can't let that as a band, any band out there, you can't let that stop you from trying or looking into it, because otherwise you're going to get to 2022 and you did nothing. Yeah, and I think that's also one of the things is in 2020, we saw a lot of artists who just gave up. They didn't play shows, they didn't release music, they didn't do anything. And in my opinion, that was the wrong move. Because all the artists like Pickwick Commons who put music out, even if it was a cover, that still keeps you top of mind in that time. So you have the continued momentum from what you had before the pandemic, where other artists who didn't really do anything, they don't have that momentum anymore. So first of all, they have to get back into the habits of doing what they need to do, but also they have to reteach the algorithms on social media, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, like, hey, people like our content. And restarting that, I can only imagine that's a massive pain. Yeah. And honestly, I'm very interested to see what's going to happen with Facebook because Facebook used to be a very important hub for events. And during this last year, the advertising changes with it not being able to track your interests necessarily, depending on your choices, the changes to Facebook pages and layouts and what info is presented to people have both changed. And now we're looking at Facebook events and people are about to get spammed with event invites again. Are they going to react to that or are they going to turn off event invites? So it's, I'm very interested to see if this is good for Facebook or bad. Obviously, the advertising's bad. And I mean, I, I totally get what Facebook is trying to do. They're trying to basically make themselves not look as bad. But all that's going to do is people will start seeing ads that are not relevant to them, and they're going to be even more frustrated with Facebook. Yeah, and it's ultimately not their fault, right? It's uh, iOS updates from Apple and privacy laws, digital privacy laws that are kind of forcing them into this corner. Yeah, and I can also see like Apple has always had this pro-privacy stance, even though there's tons of stuff that Apple has done wrong, like their technicians releasing photos of people while they're repairing stuff and that kind of thing, like (laughs) really bad stuff that you would never want a technician at Apple to do or a contractor of Apple, I believe, in this case. Either way, And this is a sidetrack, but Apple's big case against letting people repair their own stuff or letting third-party repair shops repair stuff is privacy. Your data is going to get breached. And then when an Apple-certified contractor posts nudes from a lady's phone that they're working on, it's like, so this is your argument against letting third parties repair this stuff, but you have the same problem. And you can't control everyone ultimately, right? But also, Apple wants your data so they can also advertise to you. And they don't want Facebook to have your data. They just want your data for themselves. <laughs> data wars. Oh, yeah, exactly. So that little sidetrack aside, one last big question for you here, and that is what safety procedures do you see venues and promoters adopting, both on the artist and cruise side as well as for attendees? Is that something that's being discussed during the booking process? Really, the only thing I've been hearing from big venues is capacity. Oh, this is pending capacity. And they're all just following state and city laws. There are a few venues who are more concerned that are just waiting longer to reopen. Like the Hoosier Dome's coming way after we've been having events across the city, maybe not concerts, but there have been events. So like they're kind of last, not last, but they're coming later. And I think people are going to say mask if you're not vaccinated, but I don't think anyone's going to check at a lot of these places. I think a few of them might, but I honestly think we're at a point where people, enough of the general populace, regardless of where we land as, you know, people and musicians, the general populace that just goes out to shows or goes out to bars is just already done with it. They've been done with it and they're just going to show up. Yeah. And I think as we see more and more of the country approach 80% vaccination, it's going to be easier and easier for people to not need to be as worried and not need to be as picky about the places they go. Here in Vermont, like I was saying, everything's open again. All restrictions, state level, are lifted. The federal restrictions still apply, of course, because we can't do anything about that. But as that starts to happen all over the country, it's really going to let people return to life as normal and knock on wood, it will work out and we will finally be through this thing. 
So that all said, Adam, man, thank you so much for chatting with us today and coming back on the show for essentially the third time now between the podcast and the past video interview. Super appreciate you taking the time. This is your chance to toss whatever you want out there for Pickwick Commons or Dynamic Talent International, whatever you want to talk about. You got the floor. Uh, Well, I mean, obviously, check out all of those things if you haven't. Dynamic Talent is an amazing agency that has given me a lot of opportunities this year. And prior, Pickwick Commons, obviously, I I want everyone to check it out and at least get a taste of whatever the hell Caveman Math Core might be. So (laughs) give it a shot. Yeah. I mean, right now, I'm just I'm still waiting. Maybe within a month, I'd have more news. Sounds good. Well, everything that you mentioned will be in the show notes at bandhive.rocks slash 85. We'll have links to Pickwick, to Dynamic Talent, all that stuff. And if you guys have some new stuff before July 13th, we'll add that to the show notes as well and people can go check it out. So for folks listening, go check the show notes, bandhive.rocks slash 85, because there might be a little something there that we didn't mention in the episode. That does it for this episode of the Bandhive Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening. And of course, thank you to Adam Loki of the band Pickwick Commons and Dynamic Talent International for joining us on the show to talk about everything that has changed over the past year and a half. So many changes. And who knows, by the time this episode airs, things might have changed again, hopefully for the better. Knock on wood, cross your fingers. Whatever superstition you have, wherever you are, do that. We don't want things to go back the other way. We want things to continue improving. Speaking of improving, if you are looking to improve your band, whether it's with systems, your website, your social media content, and you need somebody to talk with about that, let us know. Head on over to bandhive.rocks coaching to fill out our application. And I want to make one thing very clear. We don't look for artists who have an established following. Instead, what we are looking for with that application is artists who have the time, effort, and energy and the sheer willpower to do what it takes for their band. So it doesn't matter if you have five fans or 5,000 fans. What matters is if you have what it takes, if you are ready to commit, then we will be happy to help you make the best out of your career. So again, head on over to bandhive.rocks slash coaching if you're interested in working with us to make things happen for your band. Aside from that, we'll be back next Tuesday at 6 a.m. with another new episode of the Band Hive podcast. Until then, I hope you have a great week, stay safe, and of course, as always, keep rocking.